Good morning to our viewers in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. I'm Wiebke Wartenberg, Senior Program Officer with the Aspen Institute of Germany in Berlin, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion. Please make sure that your mics are off for this discussion and your videos on as we want this to be an interactive discussion today. We are very pleased to welcome you to the sixth event in our German-American State Legislator Dialogue, a cooperation between the American Council on Germany and the Aspen Institute Germany. The series provides a platform for subnational exchange and in-depth discussions among German and US state legislators and a broader audience on common transatlantic challenges. Both of our organizations have recognized the increasing role of subnational actors such as states, communities, and cities in addressing the pressing issues of our time. And we believe it is critical to engage decision makers and opinion leaders at the state and local level. So we are delighted to have you with us today. And with that, let me, let me hand over to Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, who will moderate today's discussion. Steve, the floor is yours. Wiebke, herzlichen Dank, many, many thanks. Uh, at the ACG, we are absolutely delighted to be partnering again with the Aspen Institute Germany. Um, it is always wonderful to, to work together. And this is, I think, a, a very special project for us. Um, the five conversations that we've had so far with state legislators have really underscored the importance of bringing together um, decision makers, um, opinion leaders at the state level to talk about issues of common concern uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And of course, today we'll be focusing on the topic of affordable housing and urban development. In recent years, I think it's fair to say, many cities in Germany and in the United States have experienced a dramatic increase in real estate values and this has made it more difficult for lower income and even many middle income um, residents to find affordable housing. The rise in prices is caused by a range of issues and those include not enough supply, but also really high demand in regions with strong labor markets. And so to help us explore how American states and how German lender are helping their urban communities address these challenges and meet these challenges, we're joined by a really distinguished panel. From Germany, I'm very, very happy to welcome Dr. Anke Frieling. She's a representative in the Hamburg Parliament and represents the CDU. And from Berlin, Matthias Schulz. He's a representative in the Berlin House of Representatives and is a member of the SPD. So herzlich willkommen to Germany. We're delighted to have both of you with us. And here in the United States, we have with us Delegate Marvin Holmes from the Maryland House of Delegates. Um, Delegate Holmes, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we, we dive in, um, I have a couple of housekeeping points. The first is, that our event today is using Zoom meeting rather than the webinar function. And we're doing this so that we can have a more interactive exchange. We hope that you'll keep your cameras on, but your mic muted so that we can see you but not hear you until the time when you wanna ask a question or weigh into the conversation. If you'd like to pose a question, please use the raise your hand function in Zoom and I'll call on you. Uh, you can then unmute your mic and um, participate in the conversation. But you can also use the chat function in Zoom to pose a question and I'll do my best to fold your questions into the conversation. If you take the mic, uh, given the limited amount of time that we have today, please don't make long statements. Um, try to keep your questions short and concise. And if they're addressed to one person in particular, please let us know who you're asking your question of. Um, so with that, let me, uh, let me try to set the stage. Um, affordable housing and sustainable urban development have become critical issues for communities in both countries. And this is true, especially when coupled with rising energy prices. A couple of statistics. In the United States nationally, there's a shortage of more than 7 million affordable homes for the nearly 11 million low-income families who need housing. There is no state 
or county where a renter working full time at a minimum wage job can afford a two bedroom apartment. And 70% of all extremely low income families are severely cost burdened, paying more than half of their income on rent. In Germany, the picture is a little bit different, but there are some similarities. Huge demand and limited supply have pushed up rents across the country, a country where renters, especially um, in, in cities, uh, make up the, the dominant part of the population. In a 2018 snapshot, and this number is likely to be even higher now, a study showed that 4.4 million households in major urban areas in Germany were living in spaces that were either too small or too expensive. So that's just kind of an initial taste, but I wanna bring in the experts now. I'd like to, to start maybe with, with each of the three of you by asking you to describe the current housing situation or housing challenge in your state and region. Um, and Frau Frieling, perhaps we can start with you and get a sense of, of what things look like in Hamburg. Yes, thank you very much. The situation in Hamburg is, um, it's said to be the best in Germany, but it's still not good because for the last 10, uh, and the situation has of Hamburg has changed over the last 25 years quite a bit. We, as a city, the city was not growing between two th the, the late 90s until 2010 or so. So we ha actually did a lot of, we put a lot of it, if effort as as a city in in kind of promoting our city and and attracting people to our to to Hamburg. So, in that regard, the situation in terms of housing was not too bad, and it wasn't very expensive. So that changed after as of like 2010, 2011. It was also the time when the start the city decided to start building more, and we've had a quite an ambitious program run by the SPD and by the joint government of red and green here in Hamburg ever since then. Um, started like I think with um, uh, a goal of five thousand uh, entities pr uh, permits permits per year, and was risen after five years to ten thousand per year. Actually, these goals were met quite often. But of course, a building permit is not an apartment you can live in. So of course, there is uh, there is a time lag, and that that keeps growing. And in terms of affordable, and plus, we also had a, 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 se a second condition, which is actually basically a very good one. That as soon as it, if you if you as soon as you build like thirty or forty or, or bigger bigger apartment blocks, you have to you have to provide afford affordable housing. So you have you will so you're probably so usually you have one third of apartments you're going to sell, one third you rent out at normal prices, and one third affordable. But of course, what happened when the pro the, the ma project managers managed uh, the cost of their buildings? They kind of um, used uh, uh, well the the two non the, the two the two important. Um, the two thirds became more more expensive because they subsidized uh, the the cheaper ones. Although the cheaper ones were also very often subsidized, of course, by uh, by the government. But uh, that's what happened. So, in terms of affordable housing, Hamburg falls short, and every single year does more so. So we have quite a few pe people who actually were eligible for to these kind of housing, but there is nothing. Of course, this situation has deteriorated with the situation in 2015 and is as of now even further deteriorating with more refugees coming to to Hamburg after the war started in Ukraine. So I think that's the short version. Yeah, I mean I, I think that's a great a great overview and a great starting point for us. Maybe one quick follow-up, which is um if Hamburg falls short in affordable housing, um, what do people do? I mean, how do they get by? Well, it's, I mean, I think that's a situation that's basically most people actually do live somewhere. 
So they just stay there. And as you said, as you mentioned in your introduction, of course, quite a few people pay more rent than they could afford. So mm -hmm. you said no more than 30%. But here, I think here in Hamburg, you have quite a few people who pay more, well, close to 50%. Mm -hmm. And of course, for them, with now with the energy crisis, is going to be a nightmare. Yeah. So we and we'll see how much the state is going, the government is going to to support them. But basically, the I mean, the people now are very very nervous. Of course, what's going to happen to them, and those who come here and have to, or those who want or need to move because they have a partner and now and have children, for them it's very hard. Um, of course, some of them try to move into the neighboring countries like Schleswig-Holstein and Niedersachsen. But um, if you want to find a, you, you just struggle and you apply and you try to, you, to do your be very best. Um, and, and if you can't find anything, then you just stay put and you try to squeeze in to mm -hmm. the room you have. And on the other hand, we have, of course, um, big groups who can afford quite a few square meters. And for that, so basically the square meter per person is all keeps growing. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. of course. Okay. I think that that's happened. That happens everywhere as well. Let's see. I I, I think that's a, a perfect um, segue to to bring Matthias Schulz into the conversation because I'm I'm certain that much of what you were describing in Hamburg um, resonates um, from a Berlin perspective. Uh, I think it's fair to say that that Berlin has seen rents um, double on average uh, every decade, right? So there's been a huge upswing in in rents uh, and it's gone from being a city that was described by its its um, governing mayor um, Klaus Wovereit as poor but sexy to um, a much more expensive place to live than than it once was. Um, Matthias Schulz, uh, tell us a little bit about the situation in in Berlin. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, um, the claim for but taxi is uh, like 10 or 15 years old now. And maybe now Berlin is, uh, um, is, is still taxi, but uh, but not poor. Um, and, you, and, it, and it shouldn't be poor if you want to rent an, an apartment in, in the city now. Um, that's the situation you can describe in a, in a short way. But maybe I can introduce in a, a, a short notice. Uh, so. I'm living in Berlin here now since uh, 2001, and in the in the early 2000s, it was very simple. Uh, you could like uh, so walk down the street and and like ripping off a tap uh, it, uh, for renting flyer, and and you get this apartment because it was free. So um, and nowadays um, you have um, um, you are you're seeking for for an apartment like like a minimum for six months or to one year uh, for for finding a. a an affordable apartment. Um, so you have several uh, crises um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the same time. It's a um, it's a renting crisis, and there are not uh, we are not able to build enough new new apartments for all the new people who are who are coming to 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 build now. Um, so it's so it's a double crisis. Um, nowadays, so and so what Berlin is doing, and it's quite comparable to Hamburg, and it, Maybe we do a little bit more than Hamburg does, but so so first of all, uh, we we try to increase um, 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 building apartments from uh, so like 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 state-owned apartments as well as private-owned ones. And um, nowadays um, we are running like yeah like um, um, six or seven thousand a year, uh, but our aim is now twenty thousand per year. Um, for even for for um, for um, uh, building enough apartments um, um, for the persons who need it now, it's it's not for for um, for, uh, for for assuming uh, the the need in a, in a, in, a, in the future, and that's uh, quite quite expensive um, as you can imagine now because the prices for for buying land and some stuff it's very uh, they increased as well. Uh, what Berlin is, is doing now, um, we uh, have a, a social a social housing program um, for, um, for 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 subsidy for for um, for private investors that they have to build um, a thirty percent um, sort of like in Hamburg uh, with social for, for social housing 
And now we are preventing uh, this year um, 750 million euros per year uh, for, 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 for subsidy that the private investors are building uh, social apartments as well. So what we are doing uh, on the second way is uh, build apartments by, by state-owned companies um, um, so that you have um, a maximum um, so like influence um, um, on, on the, um, the development of, 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 the, of the rate interest. Um, of the, no, sorry, not of the rate interest. So a lot um, for the, um, yeah, the, the, um, the rental rates. Um, what we're doing on a third level is not, we're not just looking on, on, on your apartments, but you have to look on, on the, de on, on the increasing rates, uh, in the apartments you, you, you have now, um, as you mentioned, um, uh, in the, in the introduction, um, the, um, uh, the rental rates, um, the increase in, in the last decade, uh, for like 200% from like six euro to 12 or nowadays for 14 euro. Uh, per square meter, um, maybe quite cheap comparable to the US. I don't know. Maybe you can explain if it's cheap uh, for you, but it's not very cheap for the for the people are, who are living in Berlin uh, because of the um, of the incomes um, uh, they can afford. So um, what we do is uh, like social conservation areas. <laughs> it's uh, it's based on federal law and it gives you the opportunity on a state level to implement social conservation areas. Uh, Berlin uh, has now a total number of 71 these, so these social conservation areas. And so it's called Milieuschutzgebiet for, for, for special and, and, and perverting. And they're, they're legally established um, for preserving the composition um, of the residents in, in this area. And there's, uh, yeah, um, um, so you can so so what you also can do in this area is to uh, you have to prove um, um, all all your investments in buildings if it's uh, if it's necessary to to uh, to, um, um, to 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 invest in your apartment that you can 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 rent it or if it's an an investment for for um, sort of like luxury investment to to change uh, uh, the inhabitants of the of the of, of the apartments and what uh, you can also do in these areas uh, you can you can buy these houses um, if a private owner so wants to sell it to another private owner you can you can buy it by um, by state but uh, you have to keep in mind that there's a there's a jurisdiction uh, from 2021 uh, from the federal court who, which uh, uh, prohibits this um, this way of buying houses in these areas. Um, but um, so that's a, that's uh, that are all kind of instruments uh, what we are doing in Berlin right now. So there are several several instruments on a on a federal level, so the like tenancy law and and something like so so else what we can talk about. Maybe later if you want, uh, but maybe it's quite interesting for you to uh, know that Berlin has a very special discussion because of the uh, strength of the of the of the renting crisis. Um, last year, when we had our state election, there was also an uh, uh, a vote for um, uh, like Volksabstimmung for for popular vote uh, on case of of um, uh, uh, I think about the right work for to expropriate um, private owners who, who holds more than three thousand apartments in in the city. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a really strong discussion, or it is a really strong discussion now. Uh, how you can uh, you can follow this uh, uh, this popular vote, or or should you follow this popular vote? But uh, it's a it's a sign um, that the people in Berlin are very very uh very anxious about uh, this kind housing market so so how the housing market works for them now and um so it's a very tough discussion uh, that we have in parliament and we have with society berlin now how we can solve this uh this renting crisis so um mm -hmm. that's uh, maybe the best example uh for for the deeps of this crisis yeah, Matthias Schulz, thank you so much for that. Um, as somebody who who lived in Berlin 
um, before the Vende, right? So before the fall of the wall and then um, lived in Berlin in the 90s and into the early thousands, um, I've certainly followed the markets um, a little bit. And I know that that even in the 90s and the early aughts, um, housing was an issue and was a concern. Uh, and if anything, it's only gotten worse since then um, as the seat of government has moved from Bonn to Berlin, as Berlin has um, sort of developed its economy a little bit more. And so there have been a number of pressures that have made um, Berlin a, a sought after sought after destination. I, I'd like to to maybe come to this side of the Atlantic now and and bring delegate Holmes into the into the conversation. Um, we were talking a little bit before we went live, and I pointed out that that both um, Anke Frieling and Matthias Schulz represent um, city states, uh, and so they you know have a, a sort of unique perspective because they're looking at at urban areas um, and at, at single cities. Um, of course, Delegate Holmes, you um, are in the state of Maryland and um, Maryland has um, some pretty big cities, but it also has some, some, ur some rural areas as well. And I wanna get into the urban rural divide a little bit later, but I thought that you could maybe kick it off by telling us a little bit about the housing situation in Maryland as a, as a whole. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, be here with all of you on this side of the Atlantic and, and the other as well. Uh, the housing scenario in Maryland, as is across the entire United States, uh, was significantly changed uh, when we had the uh, recession and the housing crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, there were uh, several uh, different parts of legislation that had to be created uh, to help uh, help to put a pause on some of the uh, uh, of the some of the uh, uh, persons that were being removed from their homes because of their inability to afford the mortgages. Uh, lots of federal legislation was passed, and uh, some of it, I think, went a little bit overboard uh, in terms of some of its uh, proposals uh, because of the. Uh, affordability. Uh, now we're facing a crisis just like everyone else, where it is cheaper on a monthly income to purchase a home rather than to rent. Uh, uh, I have occasions where uh, I have represented uh, some, some people where uh, they, the rents are almost twice as much as they would as the mortgages would be on a monthly basis. The problem is that uh, some of the persons cannot qualify for these mortgages uh, and because the qualifications are not can't be met for a mortgage, they are required to rent. Uh, and I have attempted to put in several pieces of legislation to try to uh, pull rein some of this in. Uh, one of the pieces of legislation that I put in uh, right during the 2008-2009 crisis uh, was a, a land bank, land bank, not a bank like a, uh, where you put your money into, but a land bank where I uh, allowed a nonprofit to partner with a local government to purchase land. Uh, and the nonprofit then could strip off uh, easements and and uh, other uh, types of, of of forbearances from the the land, and then the the nonprofit would take the land and then build upon it for um, affordable housing units. Uh, I made this a statewide piece of legislation. Uh, however, only a very few of the local jurisdictions in the state have taken advantage of it, uh, which is, I think, a, a travesty. But the only thing that I can do is make it available to them. Uh, the other issue in terms of why there's so much non-affordable housing is because of the zoning issues. Uh, zoning 
in Maryland is a responsibility of the local jurisdictions, not of a state representative. Uh, so I cannot dictate zoning uh, to the cities or municipalities. Uh, the only opportunity that I have is to perhaps be a bully pulpit in terms of what I think zoning uh, should look like. Uh, prior to becoming a representative, I was in fact uh, a, a civil engineer where I designed housing subdivisions, office parks for a living. And so I had, uh, when I became elected, I have an, an insight into how the process worked. Uh, which was very valuable to me in terms of me attempting to assist local jurisdictions in revising the zoning uh, zoning processes. One of the things we're working on now with some of the jurisdictions is to allow persons who have, uh, for example, a detached garage on a single family home, to be able to allow that detached garage to become a to be converted into a livable facility, maybe a one, maybe a, a one bedroom or a, or a, or a studio efficiency type of unit. Uh, this type of scenario would not require any additional uh, water and sewer connections because the sewer water connections are already there. Traffic uh, would not necessarily be increased because in these types of studio arrangements, it would be for a most cases, uh, uh, a single person or an elderly person. So we wouldn't have to uh, be too much concerned about impact on traffic and or impact on the uh, school student ratios being increased as well. Um, we are also facing now in Maryland, the influx of investors coming in uh, and uh, having investors willing to participate in the purchase and construction is a good thing, except that uh, sometimes the investors um, have a different scenario in mind in terms of why they are there uh, for the um, housing scenarios. Their, their interest, rightfully so, uh, is for uh, the their, their board members of their investors, uh, which makes sense. And I understand that totally. But I think we need to have an adjustment uh, or, or, or um, a scenario where some of the persons uh, who are assisting in the developers in obtaining this land for uh, apartment complex can have a scenario for different types of zoning to allow for affordable housing. I heard uh, one of the panelists talk about uh, accessible zoning in having a portion of the apartments for affordable housing. Some of the jurisdictions in the state of Maryland don't allow that. 30% uh, of uh, housing being set aside for affordable uh, is allowed in some jurisdictions in the state, but not all. Uh, and what that does is it pushes affordable housing more to one jurisdiction as opposed to the other. Uh, and that's where we, run into the uh, not in my backyard scenario for some of the uh, persons who live in, in the state. Um, and uh, as we continue our discussions, we can kind of dig into some of the other aspects of it, uh, but I'll leave it here at this moment so we can uh, dwell into some of the other issues of concern to those here on the, on the, on the discussion. Um, Delegate Holmes. Um... You mentioned that there were um, uh, single family homes uh, on some of these sites, on some of these locations in, in Maryland. And one of our viewers just um, sent a note in saying that on the, the city development, the Stadtentwicklung um, of Berlin, it lists that 54% of Berlin households um, are single person households. And so I'm curious if you have a similar number for, um, for Maryland of, of single person households. Uh, and then I wanna bring um, Matthias Schulz and, and Anke Frieling back uh, into the conversation to see whether there are any changes in thinking about social attitudes toward um, single person households. Yes, there are. Uh, I don't have a number for single 
person households, except that uh, what I can say is that most of the land development and the housing construction is for uh, uh, single family, I'm sorry, uh, uh, single house living, like a, a single family home or a townhouse or a condominium. Um, and in those scenarios, the uh, cost of the housing, uh, as indicated earlier, is significantly higher than what can be afforded in some of the mortgage applications. Uh, rentals now are, are creeping up to over 50% of their annual, in, of their monthly income. And when you get to the 50% uh, scenario uh, of the income, you don't qualify in most yeah. cases for a mortgage. Um, and that, that you know, significantly uh, makes things a little bit more difficult. Now, across the state, uh, we have farmland. And uh, in those farmland areas, uh, in most cases, there is no public water and sewers, you know, well and septic. Uh, in the well and septic scenarios, uh, that offers additional challenges to constructing ad uh, constructing additional units uh, because of the septic requirements. And we all know water is uh, because of climate change. Water wells are in some areas declining in their depth, which means digging wells deeper and deeper uh, is a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's a varied scenario all across the state. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, um, Matthias Schulz, uh, Anke Frieling. Can you talk a little bit about this this issue from the perspective of each of your cities? The single household. Um, yeah. Question. Um, I I thought about it some some uh, some numbers uh, that I can tell you. So it's it's true that um, fifty percent of the of uh, the apartments who are rented in Berlin are um, they're living uh, single households in it. It's like it's like it's quite fifty percent. And in case of um, uh, like my like the last uh, uh, um, mentioned before uh, of single family houses, uh, I'm not really sure, but it's like um, up to ten percent of all the uh, all all the housing in Berlin. So we are. 1.9 million apartments, around about, and 170,000 um, single single family uh, 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 buildings in Berlin. So, but our policy is not to designate uh, new building areas for single for single family households because of of yeah of less space in the city. So Berlin uh, is growing, and we have to uh, to use uh, uh, the space what what is lasting now uh, for building higher houses and more family households. Um, and uh, so in Berlin is a um, uh, typical way of building houses is up to, uh, to, to six floors. And now we are discussing of building higher, higher living houses in Berlin. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so those um, would be apartment buildings. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, but usually we are building apartment houses who are not, not higher than, 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 than six, than six levels, and um, we are now discussing. Okay, okay, there's not not enough space for building just just six floor buildings uh, in the city for uh, like twenty thousand apartments per year. So we have to get we have to get higher. But we are, we are discussing how high it should be <laughs> when it's really like Berlin. And is is this uh, a similar situation in, in Hamburg? Basically, yes. We also have a large number of single person households, like also more than 50%. And you, but usually, as I said before, they have quite, they, the, the apartments they live in are, are often quite big. And if you look at certain areas, especially the attractive areas downtown, these are areas where formerly in these apartments lived like a family uh, with three, even three or four children back in the 70s and today it's just one one person who lives there so mm -hmm. so we many people lose and need or you have a lot more space um, than they used to have it um we also have this debate of course with the single family homes because if you look at what people want especially once they got they have a partner and have children they all want to live in single family houses so we still there's still demand and we had 
uh, at least especially the Green Party here in Hamburg said no more houses that type and we want to have like the multi-family uh, houses or um, and apartment blocks and so on and so forth but um, this debate is still ongoing and I think we it will will in certain parts of the cities will probably keep that areas I think they're like like from whatever Dahlem in Berlin and we do have similar parts here um, and then um, at least for, as I can say it for the CDU and but we're not uh, at, on, we're not in power right now but we, we we say we don't want to want any further ceiling so what we have to do is actually the same what Matthias Schulz just said we need to buy, build higher but I mean building higher sounds very plausible and and looking at it you'd say yeah that's right if you don't want to seal so you just go up you build higher but then talk to the neighbors <laughs> so, and, they, and then you have a lot of resistance and i think that it's going to be a, it's going to be hard work but i think that's the only way to go because we don't want to use additional land that we have we i mean especially as city states you know we don't have endless uh, ag agricultural land and uh, that can that we might even be able to use. But even in that area, I think the, the basic question is in terms of climate change and, and reaching our CO2 goals, we, we can't do it any longer. So we have to go up and we have to actually use more efficiently what we sealed already. And I think Berlin has the same situation in many parts, like we have the big roads and after the war, we start building and, and this, the houses were quite small and so we, there's still a lot of you know potential in using that space better and that's what Hamburg tries to do but of course um, the plots of these the plots of these houses are actually owned by different people so in terms of you know starting a larger development it takes quite some time because you have to find an investor he has to get hold of these uh, these pieces of land and then then you can start the the actual planning and building process. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the way to go. Um, we've we've started to get into this, you know, in this conversation, and and you know, you, Frau Frieling, you just raised a couple of these points. But I, I'd like to maybe spend a couple of minutes talking about the causes um, of the housing shortage and the the affordable housing crisis that we're seeing um, in Germany and in the United States. Is it is it fair to say? that um, this is just due to not enough supply? Um, are there other factors at play in this? And um, Deliot Holmes, since you unmuted yourself, I'd, yes. I'd, I'd like to ask you know, specifically also about whether the affordable housing issue is also um, an issue of racial equity and, and fair housing and not just a you know, space issue, right? I mean, race um, plays a role in all of this as well. You, you are you are correct. Uh, the primary, one of the primary reasons for the uh, crisis in affordable housing is in fact, as I indicated at the top, zoning. Uh, we have had a, a, a view on, on um, having land zoning uh, primarily for the use of single-family homes for a very, very long time here in the state of Maryland. And it's taking, it is still taking a lot of time to change persons' minds on that. When we start talking about increasing the density, uh, then some people's minds start turning to, uh, we don't want those particular persons in our neighborhoods. And when you start talking in language like that, it sometimes can be reduced to a racial scenario. But when you start to look at, in quotes, those people, it is just persons that have less available income, which does not specifically apply to any particular race or gender. It's just those that are now being priced out. Uh, and what some are finding is that once we open up the doors, to allow affordable housing. It is not those in one particular race or the other that are making the applications. It is everyone making the applications to try to get into those affordable units because there is such a need for it across the entire state. Uh, but it's difficult to change persons' minds. 
And uh, it's like I said earlier about the NIMBY, not in my backyard. Even in scenarios where you have uh, one particular uh, ethnicity and you start asking persons to allow affordable housing, even within that ethnicity, they start declining their uh, wishes to have uh, affordable housing for fear of persons with uh, requiring affordable housing that their values may be of a different type, mm -hmm. a lower value in some cases, these scenarios. But as time goes on, we are beginning to find that people's minds are changing. However, it is a slow process. Uh, mm -hmm. And the only thing that we can do as elected officials is to keep hammering and hammering and hammering until once people see that affordable housing is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a, it's a way to get persons to, to get a leg up and to become more self-sustainable uh, like the, the larger population. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you, you know, Matthias Schulz and, and Anke Frieling, there have been some studies um, on Germany as well that have shown that people of color face greater challenges uh, when it comes to finding affordable housing. Uh, and it would be interesting to hear how this has been addressed in, in each of your states, um, particularly in light of something that's already come up in our conversation today, the influx of, of migrants and refugees beginning in 2015, but then of course, more recently because of the war in Ukraine and, and how that has um, upset the housing market as well. I don't know who, who might wanna go first with that. Should I start this time? Sure. Okay. I mean, as you were just saying, uh, um, uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, I mean, the competition for affordable housing, of course, increases, I'd say, bad feelings amongst the, the groups or, or the people comp competing for these houses, of course. We have envy, we have hostility. And as you said, of course, it's I, I say, of course, but yeah, I'm sorry. It, I think it, it, unfortunately, it is, of course, that if you have a foreign last name, it is harder for you to. Um, I don't think there, there, there's no easy solution. Can you still hear me? Because it's yes, just my. You, it's, it's you cut out for a second, but you're back now. Okay, good. Because, I mean, um, there is there there aren't there is not enough supply and that's not going to change quickly. So um, yes, we are this, there's there's of course support offered in terms of money and 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 also in finding a place, but it's but it's becoming more and more difficult. And so the city of Hamburg has done like you were talking about the social preservation regulations areas we do have them here in Hamburg as well so we're trying to keep prices um, low in that area by not uh, allowing many transactions and it's but it's also making it harder for example in terms of renovation and in terms of all you know all the things you want to do to um, to use less heating and so on and so forth so there are certain contra built-in contradictions which which also limit um, the, the these these areas but I think um, as I said before, I don't think there is any there's any quick solution to, to mm -hmm. that part. Everybody's now hoping for um, for subsidies to at least to support people during the now the energy crisis so that they can at least pay their mm -hmm. homes. In Hamburg, we're also talking about we do have quite a few um, like state owned apartments and 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 places and. Um, at least those we encourage the, to to keep to keep them there so that they don't have to move move out even if they cannot pay their rent. But as um, yeah, I'll leave yeah. it here. No, no, thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, and if I just, if I could piggyback yeah, yeah, before you, before you go to Mr. Schultz uh, to, on one of those statements that was just previously made, uh, we have toyed with the idea of removing an applicant's last name. Uh, and just putting some other type of identifier on the applicant to remove the last name, so that the uh, uh, so that the discriminatory practices that some are utilizing uh, will be eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't completed that type of legislation yet because we're working through how that process can go 
can continue with the uh, credit union identification process and the criminal investigation background process. But that's one of the things that we are that we have been looking uh, looking at. Marvin Holmes, that's very helpful because um, actually one of our viewers was curious to know what action is being taken at the state level to try to overcome some of the discriminatory practices of landlords. And obviously that's one of the measures that that can be taken. Um, Matthias Schultz, do you have anything to add to, to this topic? Uh, yeah, maybe um, a few sentences. So um, yeah, um, so again, the background of uh, the affordable rent crisis. Um, so the pressure on the burden housing market, of course, um, can be observed that the problem of discrimination in the search for housing is also increasing, of course, uh, even in Berlin. And in this context, our uh, state office for equal treatment against discrimination uh, has commissioned an and, and like it's called Urban Plus Office to prepare a study on intervention options uh, against discrimination on the housing market. Um, and the report, um, as well as so the, the actors from, from anti discrimination networks, from tenant associations, and, uh, and so on, they have confirmed that there's a special need for, 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 for intervention. And, and it's uh, so we called um, a, new, a new office, it's, it's uh, and a new paper, it's called Miss. Mission statement uh, Berlin's rent is fairly uh, subtitled, and they are um, calling some aims to to motivate a uh, variety of, of landlords to apply for uh, to allocate and rent uh, managed housing in, in a way that that's free of discrimination. So it's like um, like a, to 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 raise the last name, of course, uh, that's a, it's an opinion, but also to 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 regulate. Uh, a, there's a housing market, yeah, to to uh, to to give um, um, the people the right um, uh, to 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 um, to regulate that there there has to be some space for people who are having no money or or low income and uh, and so on. Uh, so that the sheet of paper is with, with, with several measures you can implement and you can try to implement in a in a in a, in a state, but it depends on regulation, but but also on um, 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 yeah a, 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 a free commitment of uh, of, of landlords um, that you can that you should have as well. So because uh, the possibility of regulation on a state level, it's it's uh, it shrink compared to the federal level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have lots more questions um, and a number of other sort of topics I'd like to bring up, but I also want to remind our viewers that if you have a question, you can use the raise your hand function um, or uh, post your question to the chat and we'll bring you into the conversation. And maybe while people are thinking about questions, um, I'd like to ask each of you maybe very briefly, um, what sort of an impact uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had on housing um, in each of your states, whether it's exacerbated the situation um, or whether and whether there are any maybe positive lessons we can take from the last two to two and a half years that can help when thinking about how to address some of the housing challenges. Um, Marvin Holmes, your mic is, is hot, so I'll let you sort of take a first uh, whack at that question. Sure. The uh, COVID uh pandemic has caused uh, uh, additional scenarios and problems in every aspect of life. And uh, housing is not immune from having had additional problems uh, uh, in it. Uh, the one thing that I can say that uh, has been a positive, if you can use it in that aspect of this pandemic is how we are viewing ourselves today, Zoom. Uh, previous to previous to the pandemic, we were not using this type of function uh, as well as we should. Now we're across the Atlantic and we're having uh, discussions like this. Um, what we are encouraging is uh, what we are doing in terms of legislation. We are revising the laws in how uh, persons can communicate with each other utilizing this video conference scenario. Uh, there are, uh, for example, in the common ownership communities that we have here in the United States, uh, 
homeless associations, condo associations. Previous to the pandemic, there were no established laws in how the boards of directors were allowed to communicate with each other. Uh, and because I'm how chair of the housing and uh, real estate in the, in the, in the state, uh, I've had been very, very instrumental in uh, allowing this type of meeting process. One other thing I want to talk about uh, very, very briefly in terms of affordable housing, uh, sometimes when large owners of apartment complexes uh, find that their tenants are falling behind in rent, uh, they go to the court system and immediately upon the fifth or, or sixth of every month, because rents are due on the first, uh, after the fifth of the month, the grace period terminates, and then the landlord can file eviction processes. One of the things that we have done in Maryland is that uh, we are uh, pushing legislation that says, uh, even if the landlord files a court case, uh, the landlord tenant court for eviction, if the tenant cures within an appropriate amount of time, then that filing of the eviction does not go on to the, the tenant's record. Because when a tenant has a record of being filed against by the landlord, it makes it diff more difficult for them to get additional rental properties. But if they cure, meaning they pay that, that landlord that money, then we are attempt attempting to have that uh, cured, uh, land, cured landlord tenant case removed from the, the, the tenant's record so they can move forward and get additional uh, rents, rentals uh, easier mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Matthias Schulz and, and Anke Frieling, um, what sort of an impact has did the pandemic have um, in Berlin and Hamburg, respectively, on, on housing? Um, and are there any lessons that one can take away from the, the last couple of years? Oh, um, that's a very big question, um, I, I think, uh, because um, the, the corona pandemic um, told us several lessons uh, in case of uh, housing, social housing, and even, and especially on urban development in general. Um, so uh, I think um, lots of countries um, uh, were, um, were the, in the, in the face of um, of the development during the Corona crisis, um, so they were looking for ways to to dampen the impact on the on the Corona crisis. And I think uh, for protections were mostly being used like uh, termination protection for tenants, like like mortgage release and the so rent freezes or like rent subsidies for 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 personal subsidy on uh, to. To, to, to afford your rent and to um, uh, for paying your rent to not um, get um, kicked out of your of your apartment. So and it was uh, I think a, a corona pandemic even of uh, so also in a case of um, of housing rents were told lesson that uh, state regulation is possible uh, and even a, a strong regulation of uh, how 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 rental. Um, interest rates uh, could uh, could rise or not, or not rise and how you knew a new definition maybe of social uh, social duties from uh, from house owners maybe so that kind of lesson uh, um, what we can we, what we learned um, maybe uh, all over the world and uh, especially I learned uh, during the corona pandemic and the second big lesson was, uh, the importance of um, free space around your house, of open places, of parks, of green facilities, of social facilities uh, you need for, uh, for 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 a good life and for uh, for well-being, even in a very um, in, a, in an urban area. So um, most of people had to stay home. So um, they are living in small flats. Maybe if they're from a big family and they can't afford um, a better apartment, they are living in Two, two room apartments with four or, or five persons, and then the need for uh, for free places for parks and for public spaces is is, uh, is so so is so highly recommended uh, that you have to prepare uh, in discussions on further further development um, that you have to leave the space uh, 
for a good way of living and for mm -hmm. for for a social way of living in especially in 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 big cities like Berlin, like Hamburg, uh, or like in the US. Mm -hmm. That's okay. two big lessons for me. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Frau Frieling. I think in Hamburg, what we first saw in, in the beginning and as maybe first two years um, was actually lots of people considering moving out, moving to, to the outskirts of Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And at some point, people, we started believing that, that could be a trend. So it's being investigated now. We're kind of having, we initiated a, a a, a study to find out is is it a trend is it, is it sustainable is it something that we're going to observe over the next couple of years because is i mean working from home is easier so you don't have to dr drive into town every every day overall in germany i think we're coming to this three three days work two days home uh, on average i'd say there are of course except lots, lots and lots of exceptions but as a, as a rule of thumb you, you'd say that and so it would be possible to live outside of Hamburg and find uh, maybe a house with a garden, which is really hard to find in Hamburg and um, and, and and basically for most people not afford not not affordable. Mm -hmm. Although I mean, if we look at the prices of housing, and that's something we haven't talked about because it's also something we could not have we couldn't influence in the past, and we're going not going not going to influence in the future. Is of course there were macroeconomic factors that also, of course made property very expensive because it was an it was like an, an investment case it was a good way to invest money into property but better than other ways so this situation has changed we already see prices coming down not tremendously coming down but at least they are not rising yeah. and so but but none of us knows whether this this is going to go on or not and so first is this a trend are people leaving town cities Mm. Yes, but I don't. But I don't think big time. So it will be a, a yeah. couple of people, but not big time. The actual situation, I think that it was horrible for many families. It was horrible for many families who live in small, small apartments, and it is. But but it was also horrible for, for people living alone because mm -hmm. they couldn't go to work. They yeah. they were just by themselves. And I think even now you can you see a lot more. People who are really a little lost, just mm -hmm. to say it in a in a nice way. I mean, people with depression and so on and so forth. I think it was really it's not good for people to spend too much time by themselves. So we also, in terms of you know new new construction sites, new building areas, there I think it's, community space has become a lot more important and much higher on the agenda than it has in the past. But of course, it's another thing that makes building that makes construct, construction and building more expensive. Yeah. And I think for Germany, one very important thing is actually we have to find a way to buy, to build simpler and, and, and cheaper. And we have to actually check our uh, building regulations and maybe at some in some parts and points have to say, okay, we, do, we have to go do it differently. Because if you look at the Netherlands and they also, they have the very same problems, but they build simpler and they also build faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've seen similar phenomena in the United States to, to what you're describing in, in Hamburg in terms of people wanting to move out into the suburbs in terms of the impact um, on people who live in small apartments and those who, um, who are uh, living alone. And obviously, there are a number of issues that, that need to be addressed there. I'd like to bring one of our viewers into the conversation. Um, Quanta Dawn Light has her hand raised. And so I've, I'm asking her to unmute her mic and, and pose her question. Thank you very much. Uh, you were asking about how things are in our you know, uh, areas where we live. Um, I think there is an internal migration due to climate change as well. Like I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we have an influx of people. It used to be three, four years ago, 60 persons per day, but now it's a lot higher coming from south, north, as well as west of uh, United States, because this is a temperate zone. And I think we have a perfect storm in terms of inflation, in terms of um, uh, 
the the short shortages of housing just yesterday in in the news they had given uh, people who were in subsidized housing uh, in, uh, I think they were in hotels and they've been giving eviction notices so I think we have economic climate change and also we have international refugees coming so and the, my own home has doubled in, in value in five years and not that I had made any changes so I wonder if we sometimes look at it in a fragmented way rather than look at the interconnections in a matrix it's just not one thing alone but there's so many things it's causing the housing problem in the uh, urban areas thank you very much no i mean those are i think those are great great observations um uh again marvin holmes you you unmuted your mic so i i assume that you have a, a bit of a response to that it is uh, very interesting that the uh, person on the line talked about uh, charlotte uh i had uh a couple of uh, persons within the Maryland General Assembly who are now actually thinking about moving from Maryland <laughs> to the North Carolina area yeah. uh, because of uh, because there's now, as indicated uh, by um, uh, another panelist, that there's no necessity any longer to go into an office. You can work from just about anywhere. Uh, and North Carolina seems to be a very attractive, North Carolina and South Carolina seem to be a very, very attractive place for persons are really looking at nowadays. Uh, and one of the other things that is attracting uh, persons to that particular region, uh, as indicated by uh, the caller, is the tax structure differential between uh, one state and the other. Uh, and the tax structure in, uh, I hate to admit this, tax structure in North Carolina and South Carolina is probably more attractive to those who are retiring than is in the current state that I live in. Uh, and, and that's why persons are looking at those areas. So uh, the, the income, uh, the income uh, in, in holding onto your cash uh, is a very real, uh, very real uh, uh, what people are looking for in terms of their desired location to live. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, while, while we wait and see if there's another question from our, our viewers, you know, one thing that we haven't really talked about is, is um, the transportation infrastructure and sort of the role that um, transportation plays or might play in um, having affordable housing. And um, Matthias Schultz, you were just nodding your head when I, when I brought up transportation. I, I'd love to hear maybe in just a sentence or two from each of you, um, your thoughts on, on the role that transportation plays um, in this. I mean, theoretically people can live a little bit further away from their jobs, particularly as Anke Frieling was saying, if they're not coming in um, to, to the office or to their workplace every day. Um, how is that changing the landscape? Um, Matthias Schultz, maybe you can go first and then Anke Frieling and then we'll come to, to Marvin Holmes. Um, yeah, that's, uh, um, it's, it's an interesting question because I'm also a member of um, um, uh, the, mo the mobility um, uh, people of my, my um, for the SPD. And so that's, of course, we're talking and we're facing some big struggles because uh, in the metropolitan region of Berlin, they're living now like four and a half million people, so something like that. And like, um, I think 500,000 uh, commuters per day are, are going to Berlin and they're moving on, on the, later on out. So there's a, there's, a, there's a big need for a strong public transport system um, for, um, uh, for for connecting uh, uh, the urban areas and the suburban areas and the other maybe smaller cities uh, who are surrounding uh, uh, Berlin, and that's a that's a big issue. And um, you um, um, so, so, so on one point, and you um, have to keep in mind that you you have to build a strong public transport system because otherwise. Everybody wants to go by his own car uh, to the city center uh, to go to to work and to entering uh, the place where he has to do the uh, things that he, 
that uh, they have to do. And it's uh, very strange uh, that um, all these pollution, which is uh, caught by by uh, by private transport, by driving cars and, and so on, uh, um, they um, they mostly affect people who are living uh, in the cheaper apartments who are who are located on on big streets. Um, so so most so cheapest apartments are are there. The, yeah, this kind of, of apartments who are located on on big streets on so near the airports and all these transport uh, systems who are a high high rate of pollution and it's really noisy and um, so. And that's, a, of course, a social issue uh, to organize the most pieces of, of transport and public transport that you have big, big transports like, uh, like subway, like regional trains and so on uh, to, to, to decrease the pollution and to decrease the noise uh, for all people who are, who are living within the cities and who want to get it into the city and outside. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Frau Frieling, um, anything, anything to add? On mobility. I mean, yes, of course, we don't want people driving their cars into town, especially not in Hamburg, as we're divided by a, uh, quite a large river and we don't have that many bridges or uh, subterranean um, highways. So uh, we're kind of limited in that regard. But what, what you, but I mean, if you look at the at the situation and you look at living in you know the suburban areas, as soon as you have good public transport, as soon as you have regular trains like the S-Bahn and so on, prices go up immensely. So um, it's less. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want to really uh, achieve lower prices in a great greater area you need to kind of build more 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 uh, more train connections and that's mm -hmm. i mean that's what most cities are working on from yeah. my understanding i think berlin does it we do it uh, munich does it i think that that is the thing to do yeah. it's just it's also not but it's not quickly done so yeah. for quite some time people will still use their cars and we as cities have to make sure that they still can get into the city and through the city and we cannot just say okay we're kind of reducing the width of the of the of our roads, and then, um, um, yeah, then it's your these, problem. If you can't these, get through. <laughs> these transitions obviously take time. Yes, they do. But of course, you can do, and you can go differently about it. I mean, you can be yeah. really restrictive and try to get all cars out. Um, and right now, we have a a, a government that. It tries a little bit to go that way, but what it creates is a lot of hostility on the roads. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, but it's not it's not easily done. But definitely, this is this is the aspect. If you if you as soon as the public transport system around you is very good, the prices will go up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here in uh, in our area, uh, I indicated earlier that zoning is not constitutionally allowed by those who represent states. It is a local issue. However, <clears throat> I proposed legislation uh, within the Maryland, Maryland General Assembly, knowing full well that it was not constitutional, that required local zoning uh, to build uh, housing around the train stations uh, within Maryland. Now, I knew that the bill would not, uh, was not gather muster in the legal scenario, but I was just trying to make a point. And uh, once the local jurisdictions recognized that I was stepping on their toes, the ire of them coming after me it began to inspire uh, them to push some uh, zoning around uh, local transportation, uh, mass transit stations, to the point where if you uh, are allowing housing infrastructure around the train stations, there are some incentives that are being allowed around those train stations. Um, uh, I, I think their ire has dissipated over the years because uh, once you try to do something that's right, uh, they recognize that you're only trying to do something that's right. Uh, yes. We also have revised some of the state requirements on what we, what we call P3 uh, construction, public, private partnerships, uh, P3, public, 
private partnerships. And what we have done is allowed uh, the construction permitting and uh, 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 design process to be to be done concurrently as, as opposed to in a, a stepped level, uh, which allows the uh, developers, the owners of the investments to move faster. Mm -hmm. As in indicated, um, my earlier life, I was a civil engineer and I designed projects. So I used to have meetings with my staff indicating how much money we're losing per day if we don't get a permit. Uh, and those are the things that investors look at. And the P3 process that the state of Maryland has allowed uh, is a beginning to uh, allow some of these construction processes to move a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any hands raised. Um, there was one, but it's been taken down in the meantime. So let me maybe start to, to wrap things up with, with a final question to each of you. And I have um, one for you, Marvin Holmes, about the U.S., and then one for our, our two German guests. Um, Delegate Holmes, um, obviously, uh, we've seen a, a real change um, in mortgage rates here in the U.S. Um, they are going up at an incredible rate. And I'm wondering what sort of an impact you think that will have um, on the affordable housing market in the, the mid to the long term? It's a tremendous impact. Um, because uh, those that were looking to purchase now cannot afford to purchase. Uh, and so now they're, they, because they cannot afford to purchase, now they're being uh, pushed into the rental market. And because so many people are being pushed into the rental market, rental rates are increasing tremendously. I uh, just got a call last week from a uh, over 55 community apartment complex uh, they are protesting in the streets because these are retired uh, retired individuals in apartment complex. Their rents have gone up $200 per month, and they have within 30 days to sign a new lease. Uh, and uh, I've got yeah. newspapers and TV people coming out to uh, talk to the apartment managers to see what it is that we can do to try to keep these rents uh, not going up that much so quickly. The problem that we're going to have, however, is that, and I've seen this in the past, as soon as apartment owners see such a resistance in increasing the rental rates to a market rate, those owners of the apartment complex will then throw their hands up and then they will turn those apartments into condominiums. Instead of rentals, now they become ownership. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm trying to walk a fine line with the owners of the apartment complex and to help these uh, older adults. But we can't push too hard because they'll take the apartments away. They will no longer be rentals. They now will be turned into condominium ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, so now going across the Atlantic um, to, to Germany, um, in last year's federal election, um, affordable housing was a topic. Um, it was a, a subject that came up in a couple of the debates uh, between the various candidates and the new government that, that came in in December made a pledge to build more than 400,000 new housing units. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to hear from each of you um, representing you know, both sides of the political spectrum, if you will, um, from the Christian Democrat to the Social Democrat, um, what the likelihood is that this goal of building more housing units will be achieved in light of the fact that Germany is facing a severe energy crisis um, and, and we have the, the war in Ukraine, which is also sort of taking attention away from some of the very important domestic issues that need to be, need to be addressed. Um, Anke Frieling, you, you have your mic on, so so why don't you respond first? I think actually in terms of supply chain issues and uh, rising cost of building, even before the war in Ukraine started, uh, I don't think the goals are, we won't reach the, those goals. You, you see a tremendous slowdown here in Hamburg, tremendous. You can talk to to the big um, developers, but, but even if you talk to the smaller ones, if you talk to uh, like, you know, we have these, um, 
or is it called Genossenschaften when like you you do you as you cooperate as a group of people and they can't afford it anymore because it's just it's it's unpredictable when you when you when you will get the material but it's also the the the, the cost of material has gone up tremendously so people decide okay we're going to wait we're going to wait and see how things work out and uh, so so this is not the end of the world because eventually they will start building again but for the next one or two years i think they, they will be very very cautious and nothing much is going to happen and if you look at hamburg for example if in terms of affordable housing how many units have been built until in the first half year 19 19 mm -hmm. and the goal for the year is more than 2000 and uh, the senator who's responsible, she, she keeps saying, yes, 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 it's going to come in the, in the second half of, of 2022, but it's not going to happen. It didn't happen last year, by the way. They didn't reach, reach a goal, but they, they didn't, you know, fell short that much. And, but this year, it's not going to happen. How, how could it? Yeah. Everybody's extremely cautious. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Matthias Schulz, the, the last word goes to you um, in in Berlin. Um, any any different thoughts on this perspective um, or on this issue of, of uh, the housing stock and um, and building new housing units as a priority of this federal um, government? Not really a different perspective. So of course um, the supply chain problematic and together building material like uh, the interest rates that all all prices. Are increasing now in a, in, a, in a way we couldn't imagine so like half a year before and it's in a situation now uh, not possible to 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 subsidize uh, everything uh, with public money um it's so 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 the money is uh so i think germany is a is a rich state and hamburg is as well a building um, as I mentioned in, in my first sentence as well, uh, yeah. So there is public money, but it's uh, but we need maybe some money for subsidize all the energy crisis for 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 other people and not mm -hmm. to put everything in the building sector. So uh, there are several problems we have to fix now, and 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 the money and sometimes then it's it's uh, it's like it's like it is. So but I'm I'm so so I'm hopeful that we get a better situation next year, but. I think for for this year, um, I don't. I'm not very. Um, yeah, uh, I don't look very on a, on a bright side to uh, to to rise up uh, even the permits um, um, and especially on starting building new houses in Berlin. Even the uh, public owned bu building companies are are thinking about stop. Uh, beginning new building projects so mm -hmm. um it's a very severe crisis of 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 building um uh, what's going on it's not maybe a, a, it's not a special german problem it's like a problem for like all over europe yeah um but we have to promise to to, to to build these apartments because we do need them uh on in all over germany because um yeah, um, um, um affordable housing is a problem what well, is not it's not uh it's still existing so and we have to achieve all our our strong and all our um, yeah the free money that we can have um to 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 move on in, uh on this on this issue and um i don't want to start a discussion about uh, to rise taxes and some on but <laughs> there's not the, there's not the right point now uh, but uh of course if you're shrink by money you have to look how you Maybe you can get uh, it on uh, on other ways, and it's clear um, you can't you can't solve all these problems uh, with the supply chain by money. So you have to to wait until it's going better and to to work and, and to fix all these these supply chain issues. But uh, building new houses shouldn't be a problem in money. So yeah, it it can't be a problem. In money. Well, I I want to thank all three of you for this this fascinating discussion that we've we've had today i found it to be be truly interesting and it, it underscores once again um how even if there are different nuances um in both of our countries and indeed from community to community 
there are definitely some some common challenges, um, maybe even universal problems that we have in common in both places. And it's extremely helpful to talk with each other about how we can try to develop solutions um, and try to understand how some similar problems have been addressed in other places. We did not spend a lot of time um, talking about possible policy recommendations, and maybe that's something that we can do another time. But I come away with this um, with, with a lot of interesting new ideas and a, a deeper understanding of some of the challenges faced at the local level and how the state level is trying to address that. Um, in all of these cases, though, we've seen and, and we've heard it will take a lot of time to really um, you know, come up with, with good solutions and, and implement them. Uh, but on behalf of, of the Aspen Institute in Germany and the American Council on Germany, I really want to thank all three of you for this, this lively, this engaging conversation, and perhaps even more importantly, uh, for the work that you do every day to try to address, address these issues. Um, one final note, though, to our viewers is I want to put out a, a save the date for November 30th, when we will be talking about agriculture and food security um, with a group of, of legislators as well. And so for now, um, thank you for joining us to everybody. I, I wish you a, a good day here in the United States and schöne uh, Feierabend uh, to our friends in, in Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you.